Today, we will be learning about bleaching. In layman's terms, bleaching means to make something white or lighter in color by using a chemical or by leaving it in the sun. In dentistry, it can be defined as the whitening of teeth or removing the stains caused by discoloration. According to Sturdevant, it is the lightening of the color of the tooth through the application of a chemical agent to oxidize the organic pigmentation in the tooth. Non-vital tooth bleaching began in 1848 with the use of chloride of lime. In 1864, Truman introduced a method that used chlorine from a solution of calcium hydrochloride and acetic acid. The commercial derivative of this is later known as Labirac solution. It is an aqueous solution of sodium hypochlorite. Other agents used in the 19th century for non-vital tooth bleaching included aluminium chloride, oxalic acid, pyrozone, hydrogen dioxide, sodium peroxide, sodium hypophosphate, and cyanide of potassium. In all of these, the active ingredient was an oxidizing agent that acted either directly or indirectly on the organic portion of the tooth. Only sulfurous acid was a reducing agent. In the late 1970s, Nutting began to use superoxol instead of pyrozone for safety purposes. He later combined it with sodium perborate to attain a synergistic effect. It's interesting how the home bleaching technique was discovered. An orthodontist known as Dr. Bill Plusmeyer told his patient to use an oral antiseptic, glyoxide, which contained 10% carbamide peroxide via a custom-fitting mouth tray at night. He had found that this treatment not only improved his gingival health, but it also whitened teeth. After this success, Proxigel, which is a mixture of 10% carbamide peroxide, water, glycerin, and carbopol, was marketed and replaced glyoxide for orthodontic patients because of its slow release of carbamide peroxide. And then, over-the-counter bleaching agents were first launched in the United States in the 1990s. They were sold directly to people for home use. Now, to identify the types of stains, the staining classification was given by Nathu and he described the stains as N1, when tooth discoloration is the same as that of the color of the agent, N2, when tooth discoloration is not similar to the color of the agent, N3, when tooth discoloration depends on the prechromogen, which is colorless but causes staining of the teeth. According to the location, stains can be classified as extrinsic and intrinsic. Extrinsic is when the staining occurs on the external surface of the tooth and intrinsic is when staining occurs on the internal surface of the tooth. Extrinsic stains are caused by external agents. Now, as you know, pellicle is a coating that forms on the surface of a tooth. These extrinsic stains are generated from a reaction between sugars and amino acids, and the stains are localized in the pellicle. This reaction is called as Millard reaction or non-enzymatic browning reaction. Most of these stains can be removed by routine prophylactic procedures. With time, they can darken and become more persistent, but they can still be lightened by bleaching. Intrinsic stains are caused by internal agents or internal defects in dentin or enamel like amelogenesis imperfecta, dentinogenesis imperfecta, and enamel hypoplasia. Intrinsic stains can be caused by aging. It's a very common cause of discoloration. What happens is that the underlying dentin tends to darken due to the formation of secondary dentin and this secondary dentin is darker and more opaque than the original one. So with aging, the overlying enamel also becomes thinner. This combination results in teeth that look darker. The discoloration of teeth due to aging responds quickly to bleaching in most cases. Intrinsic stains can also be due to micro cracks in the enamel or tetracycline medication. Discoloration from this may occur either before or after the tooth is fully formed. Tetracycline stained teeth are the slowest to respond to bleaching. Also, minocycline, a drug commonly used in the treatment of acne, can discolor the tooth by getting deposited in the secondary dentin. Excessive fluoride in drinking water, greater than 1 or 2 parts per million, can cause metabolic alteration in ameloblasts and that can result in a defective matrix and improper calcification of teeth. It presents as brown and white speckled mottling of the tooth. Other causes are severe jaundice in infancy, 
which can cause staining by bilirubin, porphyria, which is a rare condition that causes the teeth to become purplish brown. Dental caries also discolors the tooth. Erythroblastosis fetalis may also stain the teeth because of the destruction of red blood cells and thinning of the enamel layer. Intrinsic stains are also associated with inherited conditions like amelogenesis imperfecta and dentinogenesis imperfecta. In dentinogenesis imperfecta, the enamel gets an opalescent or grey appearance and the enamel is structurally normal but it peels off easily and the coronal aspect of the tooth appears bulbous. In this type, the bleaching treatment has an unpredictable outcome. Blood penetrating the dentinal tubules because of trauma and metals released from dental restorative materials, most commonly amalgam, also cause stains. A necrotic pulp or a tooth that is undergoing internal or external resorption is also discolored. Intrinsic stains cannot be removed by regular scaling, but they can be reduced by bleaching with agents that penetrate enamel and dentin to oxidize these chromogens. We should remember, not every tooth requires bleaching. Superficial stains or extrinsic stains can be removed easily by a rubber cup with prophylaxis paste or by light abrasion by a rotary polishing device. Bleaching is contraindicated for patients who have unrealistic expectations. In-office bleaching is not recommended for children as their teeth have a large pulp chamber or teeth with cracks. In case of in-office bleaching, a higher concentration of bleaching solution is used and later on it can cause sensitivity. Therefore, patients with hypersensitivity are also not good candidates for bleaching. It can't be done on exposed root surfaces. Patients with gingival recession that exposes roots will show yellow tooth structure in those areas. Bleaching cannot be done when there is severe loss of enamel, like in teeth that have undergone attrition. At-home bleaching is not indicated for pregnant women because it can cause gingival irritation. There is no evidence that bleaching is harmful to the fetus, but in pregnant patients normally there are a lot of periodontal problems and the addition of bleaching can cause even more irritation. It's also contraindicated for patients who are allergic to carbamide peroxide. Patients with a history of temporomandibular disorders may not be good candidates for at-home bleaching. For them, a special tray that covers only the facial surfaces of teeth might help. Another important contraindication is when the patient can't afford to change the existing restoration. Patients should be warned that as bleaching lightens the natural teeth, the existing restorations will appear darker and so they may need to be replaced. So that will increase the overall cost. Let's discuss the mechanism of bleaching. The bleaching process basically has an oxidizing agent. This agent is supposed to reach sites within the enamel and dentin to allow the chemical reaction to occur. The aim is to deliver the active ingredient to the discolored segments of the tooth to dislodge or decolor the chromatic particles. Bleaching removes both extrinsic and intrinsic stains. You know, just like how people have different eye colors, people are born with different tooth colors. This is all genetic. So there is a limit to how white a tooth will become and this limit differs from patient to patient. Hydrogen peroxide has a low molecular weight, so the small size of the molecule diffuses through the organic matrix of the enamel and dentin and then it dissociates to produce unstable free radicals, which are hydroxyl radicals, perhydroxyl radicals, perhydroxyl anions and superoxide anions. These free radicals attack organic pigmented molecules in the tooth enamel. These pigmented molecules of the tooth have double bonds and the free radicals attack these double bonds. This results in smaller, less heavily pigmented molecules. There is a shift in the absorption spectrum of these molecules. This way, bleaching of teeth takes place. That's all about hydrogen peroxide. Carbamide peroxide works in a slightly different way. 10% solution of carbamide peroxide breaks down into 6.5% urea and 3.5% hydrogen peroxide. Carbamide peroxide penetrates the enamel and dentin and then the pulp in 5 to 15 minutes and then dissociates into urea and hydrogen peroxide. These two components further break down into molecules that are metabolized easily by the body. As you can see, urea breaks down into ammonia and carbon dioxide and hydrogen peroxide breaks down into oxygen and water. Apart from these, other bleaching agents are available like superoxone which is 30% hydrogen peroxide by weight. Sodium perborate, which is available in the form of powder such as monohydrate, trihydrate and tetrahydrate. McKinn's solution can also be used to remove endemic fluorosis. 
meaning fluorosis caused by drinking water. Mekin solution has three components, 0.5% ether having 0.2 ml volume. This functions to remove surface debris. 36% hydrochloric acid having 1 ml volume helps in etching of enamel and 30% hydrogen peroxide having 1 ml volume helps in bleaching of enamel. Modified Mekin solution consists of 30% hydrogen peroxide and 20% sodium hydroxide which provides alkaline environment for the enamel to dissolve at a slower rate. Moving on, let's discuss the types of bleaching. There are three types of bleaching therapies available. In office bleaching, at home bleaching and over the counter bleaching. They can also be classified as bleaching for vital teeth and bleaching for non-vital teeth. Both vital and non-vital bleaching can be done in the clinic or at home. In office bleaching means that the bleaching material is applied in the office or the dental clinic. For this, the teeth are isolated by a rubber dam and the process can be enhanced by heat or light. For at-home bleaching, the dentist gives the patient a lower concentration of carbamide or hydrogen peroxide, which is applied in a custom-fitted tray that the patient wears at home, usually while sleeping. Over-the-counter bleaching products have increased in popularity in recent years. These products have a low concentration of whitening agent, about 3-6% to hydrogen peroxide, and the patient can apply it to the teeth via gum shields, strips, or paint on product formats. They are also available as whitening dentifices, prefabricated trays, whitening strips, and toothpastes. Let's understand non-vital bleaching. It means bleaching of endodontically treated teeth. Endodontically treated teeth can be discolored from blood products caused by trauma before root canal therapy or by necrotic tissue left in the pulp chamber by mistake. A historical bleaching method called as the thermocatalytic technique used 35% hydrogen peroxide applied to the pulp chamber. It involved the use of heat applied several times during the 30-minute period to enhance the action of the solution in the pulp chamber, after which the solution was rinsed out. The disadvantage here was cervical resorption. So alternatively, the walking bleach technique was introduced. When only sodium perborate is used, it is called as walking bleach technique. And when sodium perborate plus 30% hydrogen peroxide is used, it's called as modified walking bleach technique. Let's see how it is done. Before we start, a periapical radiograph is needed to ensure that an effective RCT has been done. Rubber dam should be placed to ensure the protection of the soft tissues. All material in the coronal portion of the tooth is removed. Cutta percha has to be removed approximately 2 mm apical to the clinical crown. The endodontic access opening should be enlarged adequately to allow complete debridement of the pulp chamber. Then, a light cured GIC is placed to seal the gutta percha of the root canal filling from the coronal portion of the pulp chamber. Excess material from the seal is trimmed off. Now, the bleaching paste is made by mixing one drop of saline with sodium perborate. Sodium perborate is another product of hydrogen peroxide family, which breaks down to form sodium metaborate, hydrogen peroxide and nascent oxygen. This material has been used for over half a century to bleach non-vital teeth using the walking technique. Sodium perborate mixed with 30% hydrogen peroxide is placed in the coronal cavity and packed against the buccal wall and then sealed in with a temporary restorative material. The area should be isolated for about 5 minutes after closure. During this time, the seal of the restoration should be checked. If bubbles appear around the margins of the temporary restoration, it indicates leakage and the temporary restoration must be replaced. If no bubbles appear, the rubber dam can be removed and the patient can leave. Now since the patient can walk around with the bleaching agent in their tooth, it is called as blocking bleach technique. The mixture may be changed every 3 to 5 days and usually 1 to 3 treatments are required to achieve optimal tooth lightening. If sodium perborate is used alone, it should be changed weekly. After successful bleaching of the tooth, the pulp chamber is rinsed and filled with a paste consisting of calcium hydroxide powder in sterile saline, but the enamel walls and margins are kept clean and free of the calcium hydroxide paste. Next, the access opening is resealed with a temporary restorative material and the calcium hydroxide material is kept in the pulp chamber for two weeks. Afterwards, the temporary restorative material is removed, calcium hydroxide is rinsed and the pulp chamber is dried. Next, enamel and dentine are etched and the tooth is restored with a light cured composite. As you know, a high concentration of hydrogen peroxide is very caustic and it can cause resorption. So, Techniques using high concentrations of hydrogen peroxide are no longer recommended. 
There are safer options available for walking bleach like the use of sodium perborate mixed with distilled water or anesthetic or 10% carbamide peroxide. A newer technique is using 10% carbamide peroxide alone. Carbamide peroxide elevates the pH which may prevent resorption. Vital bleaching techniques include an in-office technique which is called as power bleaching and an outside the office alternative that is a dentist prescribed home applied technique that is night guard vital bleaching. Let's see how in-office vital teeth bleaching is done. The first step is isolation with a rubber dam. After drying the teeth and gingiva, a barrier gel is applied until it extends about 3 mm on the gingiva and it is light cured for about 10 seconds. This protects the gingiva from the bleaching gel. Then a 35% hydrogen peroxide soaked gauze or a gel or paste form of hydrogen peroxide is placed on the teeth. The oxidation reaction of the hydrogen peroxide can be accelerated by applying heat with either a heating instrument for 2 minutes per tooth set at the maximum tolerance of the patient or with an intense light 30 minutes per arch. After the treatment is over, the teeth are rinsed, the rubber dam is removed, the patient should be informed about post-operative sensitivity. A non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug can be prescribed if the teeth become too sensitive. Bleaching treatments are generally given weekly for 2 to 6 treatments and each treatment can last for 30 to 45 minutes. Also, patients may experience sensitivity of teeth between appointments, but it is temporary and no long-term adverse palpable effects have been reported. The advantage of in-office technique is that it is totally under the dentist's control. The soft tissue is protected from the process with the help of gingival barrier gel. Teeth are bleached rapidly in this technique. The disadvantage is the cost. It is higher because of increased chair side time. The soft tissues can be injured, the outcome is unpredictable and more than one visit might be required to achieve the desired results. Also, post-treatment sensitivity is a risk. A recent study showed that light with a wavelength of 405 to 410 nanometers in the violet band is capable of performing dental bleaching without using any bleaching gel. This does not mean that bleaching using light alone will substitute for all previously existing techniques, but that by using a wavelength in the violet band, we are able to bleach teeth.